What's up, military millionaires? I'm your host, David Bray, and today we have Paul Sparks on the show. This is going to be a fun one because, well, a number of reasons, mainly because Paul's awesome and I always bring cool guests, so it's going to be a good time. But uh, Paul and I met in Keystone a month ago. We were at this real estate event, you could call it, where people who own real estate rent a big Airbnb and then go ski, snowboard, drink beer, and hang out in a house. Pretty much what it is. My bud, our buddy Dean put it together like a year ago. He hit me up on Instagram and was like, yo, I'm going to rent an Airbnb. Come drink some beer, talk real estate, and ski. And I was like, I don't know who you are, but you mentioned some other friends of mine are going, so that sounds cool. And then uh, I guess he told everyone else the same thing, and they all thought that everyone else was going, and we all showed up. And then we all became friends, and it worked out. Hey, everybody. If you have not heard yet, we are doing a live, in-person real estate event May 19th through the 21st in Tampa, Florida. I would love to see you there. We have 50 slots, 13 are already sold, and it's only open for War Room Mastermind members. So if you are a War Room member, make sure you head on over to the Circle community and grab your ticket right now, secure your spot. If you are not in the War Room Mastermind and you've been thinking about it, Hit me up so I can get you that mastermind application and you can get enrolled and get a spot because they're selling quickly. We only announced the spots two days ago. And like I said, 13 of the 50 are already gone. So I'd love to have you there. We're going to have some really cool speakers. We're going to do some happy hours, some drinks, some hangouts, some networking, some restaurants, some really cool speakers, guest speakers, keynote, whatever. And we're going to do some property tours and some uh, cold plunges and sauna action. So good times for all. Come hang out. See you in Tampa. And then, <laughs> yeah, it was the weirdest networking luck. It was it was cool. It was the coolest networking pitch I've ever had. Uh, and now we've hung out, you know, two, three times in different states. And uh, so this was Keystone. And I got to meet you this time. And Paul is, well, a real estate investor, but super deep now in the weeds on the blockchain technology, crypto stuff, and doing some really cool stuff with a guy who wrote the book, uh, Rigging the Game, which I just started. And a gentleman named Steve Trang, who is massive in the wholesaling space as far as, uh, you know, the sales side of uh, landing deals and just some really interesting stuff. Uh, what I really liked about it was the way that Paul explained the use usage behind blockchain. Um, and we'll dig into that. I'll let him get into that. And also the fact that he quoted some Nas Nassim Taleb stuff, which we always love on the show. So, Paul, welcome aboard, buddy. Man, thanks for having me, Dave. Yeah, man. Uh, why don't you give a little bit more of your backstory? I'm sure you can do a better job talking about yourself than I can. Sure. I will try to keep this brief, but uh, I'm an engineer by trade. I got into sales because I'm actually a terrible engineer, and I was selling engineering equipment. So you could call it technology, really, new tech, to some of the largest companies in the world, uh, United Airlines, Amazon, Walmart. This is where I got my start in in my career, and you know, selling technology to these large corporations taught me a lot about how to sell technology. Found my way into real estate investing, and through that process of just like buying a house, moving out, turning it into a rental, doing that over and over and over again, was able to build up enough cash flow to go full time at real estate investing. And now I spend uh, quite a bit of my time looking for development projects. We're getting ready to close here in a few weeks on an 18 unit townhouse development here in Denver. I've done some, let's just say luxury builds, uh, fix and flips, things like that. Still buying some rentals, but that's what my real estate business looks like. And, uh, Around the summer of 2021, I started getting into crypto, really, DeFi. And I was using it as a tool to create passive income to support my real estate business. So you mentioned uh, Nassim Taleb, and I'm a big advocate of a concept he talks about called the barbell strategy, meaning that on one side, we want to have assets and things that we do that are highly reliable and stable. And then on the other side of the barbell, we want to take bets that are that have asymmetric opportunities for the upside. And I don't know any other place better than that in than the crypto space. It's highly volatile, you know, lots of highs and lows. I mean, these pump and dumps, you see them, uh, and it's very real. But we can we can make use of a lot of that stuff to create a massive amount of upside. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of a little bit about me. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I absolutely. I mean, before we jumped on, I was telling you, I dabbled a little bit in the crypto game and, and I read some books and that was the best argument that I heard about the crypto space when I was first like, this is dumb. It's so volatile was people talking about using it as a one to 3% of your normal investing portfolio. And then you could have, you know, like, even if you're just an index fund person, like your portfolio could be 95, 97% index funds. And then just like that little bit that is as volatile as all get out. And if you have a, a thousand X return on it and then pull and dump it into your index funds and, and the, they were breaking all the math out and I was like, man, that's really cool. And so then I, uh, it, it's actually kind of funny cause you know, the whole Dogecoin debacle debacle in 2020 or whatever. Um, I put 200 bucks into that probably six months before Elon's first tweet. Hmm. And it turned into like $14,000 <laughs> and, uh, I sold and I sold it when it was like, I don't even know, um, like seven cents. So I sold it. I mean, I could have probably turned it into like, I don't know, like 50 grand or, I mean, the math was stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget exactly where it went up to. Uh, but that was like one of those perfect examples of crazy asymmetric rec risk. I'm like, I could lose $200 and it went to like 14,000 and I probably could have made almost triple that or so I forget what the math was. Cause it was like, every time it went up like five or 10 X, I would just sell whatever my initial little bit was mm -hmm. so that I couldn't lose anything. And then I, I took that 14 grand, bought a duplex <laughs> and I took that, I sold that duplex 12 months and one day later and made $50,000 and rolled it into a hotel. <laughs> Love it. Classic barbell like, stuff, man. It was freaking stupid. I'm like, and all these guys that I was in my office were like, I can't believe you took that stupid bet on. I'm like, dude, it was $200. And so at that point in the game, I was just putting like a hundred dollars into all these random stupid things. And some of them paid off. I probably made 20, 30 grand and just stupid guesses and bets on, you know, I wasn't even doing any research on the cryptos. It was just, what are people starting to talk about online? Because at the mm -hmm. time, that was all that seemed to matter. It was funny. Well, and everybody treats worked. crypto like gambling. And it is. It is gambling. Um, yep. The way that most people approach it. You know, they're buying a coin and then they're hoping that it goes up in value. And to a lot of us real estate investors, that just doesn't make much sense. That's not how we invest. We don't go out and buy a house and then just put no renters in it, get no debt on it, do no work to it, and then just hope that it goes up in value in two to three years and sell it. That, that just makes no sense to us. Yep. So really what I was able to, to figure out how to do is not just take a bunch of my principal and buy coins, hoping that they were going to go up in value. What I learned how to do, and you mentioned my, my partner, uh, the guy who just wrote a Wall Street Journal bestseller called Rigging the Game, is... Well, he taught me an operating system, the same operating system he implemented when he was consulting for Microsoft and other Fortune 500 companies in the early 2000s. And he showed these types of companies and, and worked with them to build what he calls a business treasury. So it's this idea that as business owners, and Microsoft is a great example, they manage over $200 billion of investable assets. They don't just take that money and stick it in Chase Bank. They also would never take it and just start gambling and guessing that coins are going to hit, right? They are looking to create reliable, consistent returns from that in order to support the operating side of their business. So the whole concept is if you have a real estate business and you're spending money on marketing to acquire properties, maybe you're, you're running a team, let's just say that you probably have some overhead in that business. Well, if you could create a business treasury, which is a, you know, a way to sort of behave also as a bank that could kick off enough cash flow that it could offset the operating expenses of your business so that now your business runs at net zero. So every deal you do is profit. That's the concept of the business treasury. And so we took that those principles, those that framework of of how Dan has helped other small businesses do this and just applied it to our real estate business. And one of the places where we can get fairly reliable, consistent returns that are much higher than you could get in a typical money market or something like this is through this process of uh, yield farming, essentially, in DeFi. So you're, you're creating cash flow in the same way that we would buy a house, stick a renter in it that pays the loan down, 
you know, we're getting all sorts of cash flow and benefits. We're doing the same exact strategy, but just in a different realm. And in this case, DeFi. Love it. Yeah. That's super cool. And I, like, like I said, I just started the book. I might be like halfway through the intro. So I unfortunately haven't made it far enough into your recommendation to be able to have an intelligent conversation about his strategy. But that does sound really, really, really cool. So, okay. So now one of the things that fascinated me about your presentation in uh, Colorado was, I mean, you were just able to break crypto, which this is okay. So this is, if we backtrack, this is hilarious to me because you, you said it, not me. So I'm going to poke the fun because you said you're a terrible engineer. And the, the reference that made you say that was because you got into sales, which I found hilarious because I have known every engineer I've ever known has talked about how engineers are all terrible at people. Um, which is <laughs> hilarious to then hear you say that you got into sales, which is what makes you a bad engineer. Uh, but then even funnier, because the reason that I that you stuck out to me so much as a pres presenter was your ability to take blockchain and break it down into such a simple concept to understand, which is obviously a sign of, of somebody who's, well, really smart, but also really good at people. Um, you know, they say like the ability to take a complex subject and make it really simple is a very difficult skill, but also, you know, incredibly useful with people. Uh, so all of that's just hilarious when you think that you start out as an engineer to me. But um, why don't you, if you want to maybe key in on one or two of those things that some examples of uh, like blockchain uses in like day to day that, you know, some of, some of the stuff from that presentation or because uh, I know people, we've had a couple people on the show before who've talked about blockchain and crypto, and I know that there are people listening who are still just like, I've heard it all, and I don't get it. Yeah. Um, and we're going to dig into what where you guys are going and what you guys are building, which is really, really cool. But I think in order to, for people to actually like tune into that, they need to kind of understand the, the at least from, from the basic simple breakdown that you have been able to make why blockchain actually matters in a way that is not technical. Yeah. Well, let me, first of all, thank you for the kind words. And um, yeah, that has been my skill set taking, and I did this, I think this is why I had success in the corporate sales world, selling to some of the largest companies in the world. People still, they don't buy technical facts and features. They buy the benefits. They, they you know, um, and here's the problem is when you're looking at any sort of new technology, the people who understand it first are the innovators and the early adopters, and they understand things through technical facts and features. You know, it's like, it would be like if you ask somebody in the late 90s, early 2000s, what is the internet? And they started talking to you about, well, there's all these wires and tubes and zeros and ones and binary code and, you know, like giving all this technical stuff. And, and most of us are like, what? I, I don't have any frame of reference for any of that. What does that actually mean? And if you really ask somebody, and this is what I did in my presentation, is I asked, hey, what is the internet? What does that mean? Right. And what, what you find is people start telling you, not the technical features of what it is, but they describe how they use it. So, for example, the internet is this cool thing where you and I can get on a video, you're on the other side of the country, and we can have a conversation. And, you know, or I can, I can shoot you a message, and you're going to get that in about two seconds. We call that email. And here's what also the internet is, is... Uh, social media, and it's all these different ways that we use it. We make practical use of it. And that's how the majority of the population understands technology. Problem is, is we're taking our, we're getting our information from the folks that are like very technically minded. And there's nothing incorrect about what they're saying. But if you want to connect technology to the masses, you have to connect it to pre-wired ideas. So one of the things I like to start by when I explain blockchain to somebody is the Microsoft Excel example versus Google Sheets, right? And, and Microsoft Excel was this dominant powerhouse in industry for, I mean, I would venture to say probably 20, 30 years. And they completely dominated that industry. 
I don't even know what you call that industry, but just, you know, spreadsheets basically. Uh, and then Google came along and they said, actually, we love your product. It's fantastic. We're going to keep the logo almost identical. The user interface is going to stay the same. The functionality is going to stay the same. You know, if you get on Google Sheets, it looks almost the same as Microsoft Excel, but it has one small difference. It's on the internet. And what that means is now you don't have to download the Excel file and I'll send it to Dave and then he's going to download it and rename it and make his changes and send it back to me. We all use the same exact spreadsheet in the same exact place. And that is, a, is an analogy for what blockchain is. Instead of I've got a spreadsheet and Dave's got a spreadsheet, we have one place where we go to keep all the information. So I think of blockchain as like the first column in Microsoft uh, in Google Sheets. Not only do we all have access to the same sheet, it's a public sheet, anybody can see it. But every time something happens, it just gets entered in on onto a new line. And why that's beneficial is that we're all sharing the same data. I don't have to worry about, is this the right revision? Is this the right spreadsheet? Do I have the most updated data? It's all in one place, and so we can all make use of it. Another example I use to connect to this is like the fossil record. So talk about the original blockchain, right? It's this idea that everything that's happened in the history of the earth has all been recorded in one place. It's in the layers of the earth as it stacks up. So we don't have to sit here and speculate what happened. We can drill a hole in the ground and fill and figure out exactly what happened over time because we all have the same source of information. That's essentially what blockchain did is it put everything in one place so it can it can be verified by everyone and there's not a, you know, multiple spreadsheet situation where we're all sitting here saying what's the correct data? It's all got put in one place. I'll explain why that's beneficial. But for those who are still understanding what blockchain is, I want you to think of it in terms of a Google Sheet. It all goes in the same place. We share it with as many people as we want. It's public. And everything that happens just gets recorded into a new line. Yeah, I love that analogy. And and it's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's simple, right? I mean, that's exactly what it is. And it, you know, I mean, the other beautiful thing, right, is just, you know, nobody can erase it yeah, exactly so it's like a google sheet where you can't screw it up you know unlike the google sheet that i had for my mastermind where someone deleted it yeah uh, still don't know who that was but all my contact info for anyway it's my uh, fault. I'm sure, I'm sure well and so that's i think the the problem is is like people have a tendency when they hear blockchain or when someone's telling them about blockchain is they're describing all of these things like it's a digital immutable ledger, fully transparent, yada, 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 all these like phrases and terms that we're just not familiar with. And again, it's like describing the internet in a way that I don't care about all those things. I just care about how do I make use of this, right? Yeah, exactly. Immutable ledger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cold I mean, storage. It just, Cold storage makes blockchain amazing. Right. And everybody's right. like, what right. are you, you saying? Know, what does that mean to me? Anytime you're talking about technology, if you start using words that the other person doesn't know, you've immediately lost them, right? You have to connect things to pre-wired ideas. And so, you know, what I'd like to do is just spend the rest of this time talking about, well, why is that useful to us as real estate investors? Because again, I, I, okay, let's say you understand what blockchain is. In the same way, maybe you understand what the internet is. But if we can't use it, well, who cares? What's the point? So what, I, what I've noticed is that uh, when, I, when I got into blockchain, it was because one of my close friends, guy I'd worked with for years and years, he called me up and he was sort of like, hey, you won't believe this. But I just, he actually had turned $50,000 into 500 in, you know, a couple months. That 500 turned into, uh, that 50,000 
through the middle of 2022 turned into $40 million. And it was like, I mean, that's just a, it's an unfathomable amount of wealth to generate in that amount of time. And he's one of a dozen people that I know that have had similar experiences with this. There, of course, that $40, $40 million is now probably like three or four because the market has completely pulled back. What we noticed through this process is a lot of these crypto, a lot of this new money has a problem because barbell stuff, right? That's not exactly a reliable asset, crypto. It's a great way to create a ton of asymmetric upside, but you need to have a downshift. You have to, I mean, in my opinion, you need to find ways to preserve that wealth and lock in your gains. And so the first kind of aha moment that we have was like, well, I went to Tom and I said, okay, Tom, so take some of that $40 million. Let's take it off the table and go invest in real estate. And he was like, well, you know, in order to do that, it means I've got to break, a, and again, I'm going to use some words that people aren't familiar with, but I got to break apart my liquidity pool. I got to s- send my coins back to MetaMask and then move them into Binance and then swap those for US dollars, send it back to my bank account, wire it to your bank account. You're going to go invest it. And then you're going to give me cash flow and I'm going to move it all the way back around. And their response was like, no, that's too many steps. Like, I don't, that's too much. I'm just going to stay here. So what we said was, wow, what if we, that's kind of ridiculous, but okay, I get it. Um, How do we make this easier for these people to downshift? And what we know about crypto people is, boy, do they love to press buttons, right? (laughs) What if we could give them a button that they could press and they could buy a token that would be pegged to real estate? And of course, uh, now... They are feeling the pain because that $40 million turning into four and they're saying, damn, I really wish I had downshifted into some real estate. So what we're trying to do is help. There's a trillion dollars in the crypto market right now, and it just fell back from three trillion. I have a strong macro belief in in the utility of cryptocurrency. I believe that it's going to surpass 10 million or 10 trillion. Um, fairly in the next, let's say, five to 10 years. So there's a pretty substantial market that really has no way to get into real estate currently. So what we're trying to solve right now is essentially what we call real estate tokenization. So as real estate investors, we all go out and we buy real estate. A lot of us have funds or syndications that we raise money to go out and buy multifamily or self-storage or develop townhouses or whatever. And the idea being, if we can make it so that these crypto people can buy into our fund by pressing a button and buying a coin, they can now start downshifting out of these more volatile assets and into significantly more stable assets, getting long-term wealth. As we like to say, we're trying to help the new money get old man assets. (laughs) Oh, man. It, and it's true too, though, because I mean, I saw that and it, it's easier. It's always easier said than done, right? In hindsight, it's 2020, uh, literally, I guess, uh, just the other day or two years ago, three years ago. Holy crap. Um, but, you know, when you're winning, why, why would you pull any exactly. money out to stick it in something safe? Why would I invest in bonds or real estate or, you know? something fixed but i mean that's it just goes to show you the mentality of like the difference in investors you know because you you heard me say that i was selling all the way up on dogecoin right my returns would have been much better had i just held until the end when i decided to exit because every time i sold when it doubled i killed what my return would have been the next time i sold when i doubled Uh, but also every time it doubled and i sold i guaranteed that i wasn't playing with house money anymore. Mm -hmm. And then it doubled and I sold again. I wasn't playing with the double of house money and it doubled and I sold again. Now I'm not playing with the double of the double of house money. Um, And so it's, you know, hurts ever less. So when it finally did tank and I lost whatever was left, whatever, I've already pulled out, you know, 13,000 and some change over my initial investment. Who cares? 
Mm -hmm. And so if that guy at 40 million had gone and purchased a $10 million apartment complex cash, maybe, you know, it would have gone up from 40 to 60 and he would have gone, oh man, this stinks. And then it crashes down to 20 and he would have gone, oh. Yeah. Well, and this is the result, in my opinion, of biological hardwiring in our brains, like our survival brains that have evolved over millions of years don't serve us necessarily when we're talking about investing because we're so wired towards chasing more, you know? Um, There was a point in our history where we didn't know where our next meal was coming from. We had to, you know, maximize for every single opportunity. We were constantly trying to chase more and more and more, and that doesn't serve us very well now. And so part of what we do in our community and what uh, we have built as the foundation through working with you know Dan and this book, Rigging the Game, is an operating system that biases getting closer to what we call the solvable problem. Right? It's this idea that a lot of us real estate investors we understand this. We were indoctrinated this way through the bigger pockets, you know, stuff and just the mantra of like, well, if I can collect ten thousand dollars a month in passive income by you know thousand dollars a door. Okay. I need 10 doors. I can live the life that I want to live. Great. That's a solvable problem. You know, I'm a math guy and an engineer. We need to create something that can actually give us a, an indication of, are we getting closer? Do we need to take on more risk than is necessary? I think no. Right. But the problem is, is if you don't have a solvable problem, you're going to err on the side of, your brain's going to tell you, yeah, but if I get another double up at 40 million, that's going to be 80. And that's more than 40. Mm. <laughs> right. And it's like, but who gives a shit? Because if you're not getting closer to the things that you actually want in life, you're just chasing more and more and more. And what we know about uh, reading guys like Nicholas Taleb is that you're leaving yourself highly exposed to total ruin by doing that. Right. It's not about how the only way to know how much you can make or get is to get there and lose it all, right? Like it's the only way to know how much you could, how far you could have gone is to press the boundary so much that you step over it and now you lose. And so that's just like the mentality that we're trying to help people avoid as by giving them an actual solvable problem to say, well, yeah, in this case where you're like, yeah, if you just take 10 million and slice off and go buy apartment complex, that'll produce a million dollars a year conservatively, but they don't think that way. So it's a lot of education and it's a lot of giving people the actual financial tools to go out and use things like crypto and real estate, have a balanced barbell, but ideally you're investing and using these tools to help you accomplish some goal in your life. And if it's if the if the equation you're solving for is just infinitely chasing more and more and more, it's a re- it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, people people always ask me, you know, that that age old like if you won the lottery and you won like a hundred million dollars, what would you do? My answer, the first part of my answer is always like the most boring thing in the world. And I say that, you know, and then when it happens, I'm gonna go crazy, right? But but when I, my answer is always like, well the first 10 million is going to go into a combination of CDs, bonds, and savings accounts. Because once that's done, then I can lose the other 90 and who cares? Because I can live on 10 million in bonds and I can't lose it. So, you know, and then we'll put another 10 or 20 or 30 into just cash purchase, you know, 50 to 70% LTV or 50 to 70%, you know, cash purchase, or maybe hundred percent cash apartment complexes and mobile home parks and, and storage sure. units and upside plays, whatever you yeah. know. And upside, then, and then I got fifty million to go buy my Ferrari and yeah. gamble <laughs> on Bitcoin and venture capital and <laughs> see the world and you know fifty fifty gamble on VC and and see the world and whatever. Mm-hmm. Live my life. Give to all the family members who are going to show up and tell me they're my long lost uncle I've never met. Well, and I resonate with that so deeply. I like to say that my solvable problem is that I want to be able to play business like a sport. I am a competitive, I don't know, athlete. I, my, my game of choice is basketball. I play a lot of pickup basketball. What I like about pickup basketball is I don't have to show up for practice. I don't have to show up. 
I show up when I want to, you know, when I'm in the game, yeah, I'm playing hard. I'm trying to win. But when I step off the court, whether I won or lost that pickup basketball game has absolutely no bearing on my mental state. And boy, what a cool scenario that would be to have so much reliability in your life that now you can go out and play business like a sport, like you play pickup basketball. I'm going to try this because I want to play. Like, and there's going to be times in my life when I don't want to play. There's going to be times in life where the, the, uh, the, the chances that this goes right is very low. But I'm just, I want to play because I want to play. And you can't do that without having highly reliable assets that are not just reliable, but it's predictable, right? If there's no predictability in your life, it's going to be really difficult to play on that other side of the barbell. Or if you're Tom Brady with FTX. Oh, wait. Too soon? Too soon? No, just kidding. <laughs> Probably too soon. Yeah. Probably too soon. Um, <laughs> anyway. Okay. So, all right. So they push button. Now let's go back to the good stuff. All right. Tokenization. So from my understanding, and I've talked to a couple other people who've talked about tokenization, because I was always, my I always liked the idea of, of the fact that blockchains eventually going to replace title companies because they're archaic and need to go the way of the Dodo anyway. So I'm excited about that. And it's slowly starting to happen. We're seeing use cases emerge, which is super exciting to me because that's going to be fun. Um, I thought that that would be something I could pursue until I realized that I can't wrap my head around blockchain enough to ever make it happen. But uh, anyway, tokenization. Um, my understanding is essentially that it's it's almost like uh, uh, a REIT, um, right? Where, or not a REIT, but like a... You're, you're basically it's it's like a syndication, but you're just buying a token, like a, a crypto, instead of a share in yeah. a, a syndication, right? I mean, I think of it like in the same way that we buy stocks in a company. You can it's actually it's actually the same exact thing, right? So if you're if you're an investor, accredited or not, if you invest in a fund, there's different types of funds, right? And again, I don't know how familiar your your audience is with all of the different types of investment vehicles to raise money in. But a fund is essentially where you're going out, you're raising money from a whole bunch of people. You use that money to then go buy real estate. There's all sorts of types of funds, right? Multifamily, self-storage, single family funds, all different flavors for all the types of real estate that's out there. And right now, the way that this works is, you know, Dave, let's say you run a fund and it's a single family rental fund and you're going out and you're raising $10 million dollars to go out and buy a bunch of real estate. Well, you've got all these different investors who are going to give you different amounts of money and you have to create what's called an allocation. So in the same way that you buy stocks or shares in a company, you're getting an allocation from that fund based on how much you buy in. And currently fund managers do all this stuff. I like to say like by hand, you know, they're using spreadsheets to manage all this. They're using software that's been built, you know, to, to manage these different things. And it's like, you've got distributions, you've got contracts that need to be signed and all this stuff has to be managed. Well, again, the best part about blockchain is all that stuff goes into one place. And so you can use this technology to automate all of that. So you might've heard of something called a smart contract. It's essentially a computer algorithm. And so you can set up essentially a computer algorithm that will manage all of the people that invest, all of the distributions that need to go out based on how much they put in. And you can use a token to represent the allocation. So instead of me like sending you a whole bunch of paperwork, what you do is you just say, well, if you have this coin, it's just going to automatically distribute what needs to to you because we put this on a smart contract. So in the same way you buy stocks in a company, you can buy coins or what we call tokens in a real estate fund and everything would be distributed to your wallet based off of having that coin. That's super cool. Yeah. I love it. And so it's kind of like going from doing I the best analogy I think of was, you know, in school our teachers made us do everything by hand, like our, our math problems and work it out by hand, show all your work, yada, yada, yada. And I sat there and be like, this is crazy because I have a calculator right here that will do all that for me automatically. Uh, that's sort of what we're talking about here. Right now, everything's been doing uh, is being done by hand. 
and we have a calculator that can manage this. So not only are we able to take money from a, a completely untapped capital source. So as real estate investors, if you're looking to raise money, there's a trillion dollars in that market that desperately needs what we have to offer. Um, I'm, I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, but another analogy I like to think of is PayPal. You know, in the early 90s, in the 90s, uh, businesses didn't transact over the internet in the same way that real estate investment companies don't really transact on blockchain yet. But what PayPal did is they came in and they said, hey, we can bolt this onto your business. And now you can take money in digitally through the internet. All that it did is it allowed it, it made it significantly easier for businesses now to grow, to get access to people's money because it, it lowered the barrier of entry. Now I don't have to send you a check or physically hand you cash or I don't know any of the other things that we did in the 90s to transact. It's like you can just press this button and send your money over the internet. That's the same thing that we're trying to solve for right now, which is how do we help the trillion dollars in that market, these people who have a bunch of capital, but it's I, I can't use Bitcoin to buy a house. So I need to be able to convert it to dollars. And what PayPal did is they just said, we'll do all of it. You don't really need to know how the sausage is made. Just press this button. We'll take it from here. And that's essentially what we're trying to solve. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, so essentially you're trying to get guys who have money in crypto or, or are investing in crypto, you're trying to create a, an easy button, literally a button, an easy button for them to be able to take their earnings and move it into a passive physical asset that has a hedge against getting tanked, you know, long-term, right? So it's, it's not necessarily like bonds or savings account, but it is a, it's real estate. So it's a asset that is much less likely to go crashing down and the Bitcoin does its thing, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's just a volatile asset and it goes up and it goes down and it's going to go up again and it'll go down again. And it is what it is. And that's what it does, yep. at least for now. And over time, it'll probably stabilize. And I say that, but God knows who knows, whatever. I should probably also say over time, it'll get more volatile and then maybe I'll be right. But um, it's too new to know. Right. Yeah. That's the, what is the, what's his, uh, the Lindy, Lindy theory. Um, where you know the, the older it gets, the more accurately we'll be able to predict it. Mm. Well, and it, it's this is a this is something that I think solves a big problem for crypto investors. Yeah. But it also solves, in my mind, a big problem for capital raisers, real estate investors. We're all you know I don't know you familiar with the blue ocean, red ocean versus blue ocean idea. And it's like well we're all in the same going after the same capital. At the moment, hedge fund money, IRA, you know, retirement account money. No one has figured out how to tap a trillion dollar market that desperately needs what we have. And so as real estate investors, if we can open up this bridge between these two worlds, we, I mean, we can capture a significant amount of capital from an untapped source, right? So it allows us to grow our portfolios. It allows us to scale. And provide education to a market that is currently just doesn't have it. Ooh, interesting question. And I don't know if this is going to take us on a rabbit trail that we don't have time for. So maybe we just deter this question to a later time, but tax implications. And so obviously, like from your end on the syndication side, this would be normal K-1, typical tax, nothing changes. One of the perks, at least as of right now, for a lot of crypto guys is that, from my understanding, uh, things can kind of just not exist. Hmm. Uh, I'm wondering if there, if you're going to run into a, investors who have a significant chunk of capital that doesn't exist that want to invest with you and, and don't want a K-1 and what that might be end up doing to your, your, uh, it's, I don't, I'm just thinking out loud. I wonder what yeah. that, you know, if I had $40 million that the IRS didn't know about, I wanted to throw 10 of it at you. I probably wouldn't want a K1 to file. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, 
Um, maybe this is not <laughs> obvious, but I am not a tax advisor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and none of this is financial advice. So uh, I'll preface this by saying that. Now, secondly, what we know about blockchain is, well, the SEC is not super fond of crypto. However, they are very fond of blockchain technology because they are a very small entity relative to the massive amount of money and investors that are investing. They don't have the bandwidth to go around and police every you know, dollar that's being invested. So they set up these 506Bs, 506Cs. They have certain regulations for this. You have to meet certain requirements. And none of that changes by doing this, right? This is still why, why I call it a token is I'm shortening it. It's called a security token. So this is still a security that is registered with the SEC, which means you still need to provide verification of your uh, accreditation status. You still have to sign documents in the same way. All that it is doing is it's, like, it's, it's the PayPal, right? We can accept a different type of currency and you can pay with it this way. Why they are very fond of that is because it makes it significantly easier for them to track. This is not going to help the person who is trying to avoid taxes, <laughs> right? If that's your strategy, downshifting into real estate is probably not a great idea for you in the first place, right? This is someone who is actually looking to build a financial fortress uh, to actually build wealth in their life. If you want to stay playing with all this internet money, you're probably not going to be a good fit for what we're trying to do, which is to help you acquire legitimate hard assets, right? Again, I still have a long-term belief in crypto. I love playing on that side of the fence. And there are a lot of people who are doing it because they're trying to avoid some level of uh, tax implication or scrutiny, let's just say, in some way. And uh, I can't help those people. That's not going to change with this. If you're trying to play above board and actually build wealth, this is a tool to help you downshift into those things. Yeah, fair enough. And that being said, I mean, you know, cost segregation and everything else, there are still enough tax advantages with real estate that it probably would be less of a hit than anywhere else you were to move your money. So, yeah. You know, other than maybe. It just is what it is. You know, it's like the government is catching on to blockchain and DeFi. You know, um, it's not a secret to those people. They are fully aware of what's going on. I have a lot of my, my attorney or my accountant is Dan, uh, the guy that I partner with. And, and he has a lot of exposure, let's just say, to that world and understanding the changes and things like this. Those people that are trying to avoid taxes by sheltering it in crypto, they're, it, you know, your time's closing in on you. Let's just say that. You know what's interesting? I just thought of not to completely derail, but in that same realm, the the absolute best way to avoid taxes, right, is probate. You know, we I always make that joke in real estate world, just like you just hold on to it till you die, and then you pass it on to your kid, and they get the you know tax it, uh, the you know value at whatever it is when you when you passed away, so uh, present value or whatever. I wonder how that works in the crypto space because. I mean, shoot, I wonder how much of this stuff just gets lost when people die. Like how much of the, like just never to be seen again or, or they go to, it's like, you couldn't, you couldn't pass it along at present value. I don't know if you could claim it at anyway, whole, whole nother world. It but. is definitely a rabbit hole <laughs> and something that like we've talked about before. We actually, yeah, I mean, it's come up where like somebody passed away and they had a bunch of crypto and we were all just sort of speculating, like, well, do, how does he, how does his family get access to this, even if they wanted it? How does this handled? So, yeah, it's still the Wild West in a lot of ways, but regulators benefit by regulating. Let's just put it that way, right? So, it, it, and in fact, if we want crypto, uh, I think of the analogy of like the airplane and the FAA. When the airplane was invented in the early 1900s, it was dangerous. Like getting on a plane was very dangerous and planes were falling out of the sky, <laughs> you know? And then the government came in and created the FAA and they said, "All right, we got to make some rules here because 
we can't just have planes falling out of the sky and people dying. So they came in and made run to regulations and here's how we're all going to stay safe. And then what happened? The airline industry completely boomed. Yeah. And it's my belief that we're sitting on the cusp of pre FAA and everybody is all scared of regulation. But what, what we know about innovation is that without safety, the ma- the masses cannot adopt it. Do you think if you're a fiduciary for a large company like Microsoft, let's say, and you have $200 billion in investable assets, you're not going to put your fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders is to stay away from crypto because there is no regulation. Especially after what just happened with FTX, nobody wants to run into it right now. They're like, oh, yeah, no thanks. That's scary. You'd be um, violating your fiduciary responsibility. But if there is regulation, what does that do to your fiduciary? It opens the door. It means you, you're probably obligated to have some level of exposure to it. So my point is like, well, we shouldn't be afraid of regulation at all. We should be encouraging it. Now, it's going to flatten out the returns because you're going to have all this money flooding into that market. So I truly believe the, the best opportunity for asymmetric returns is now in that market because there is no regulation. But it also creates a lot of uh, risk and uncertainty in that market until we have you know, the government step in and tell us what rules we all need to play by. Similar to how the FAA did with the air, with the uh, you know airline industry. That's that's how I see it at least. Yeah. No, I love it. All right, Paul. Is there anything we missed? Probably, but uh, yeah, probably a whole lot we missed. Crypto is a rabbit hole that you know. Again, I, I what what we know is that people understand technology not by technical facts and features, but how we actually make use of it. Right. So what we talked about today was one of the use cases. It's a, it's a, it's a way to, to bridge capital in the same way that PayPal did, right? There's other tons of applications. Like you mentioned, Tidal. Um, we talked at our event about the idea of, um, in the same way that Carfax tracks everything that's ever happened to a car from buys and sells to maintenance, accidents, all sorts of stuff like that. You could do the same thing using blockchain technology with houses, home facts, property facts, these are applications that are perfectly within reach, let's just say, in the next five to 10 years. And that's, I think, what excites me the most is we actually can make uh, use of this blockchain technology as real estate investors to just to add and bolster the businesses that we already have. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm excited to see where it goes for sure. Um you know, I definitely still have a little bit of it in my portfolio and I'm still keeping my eyes on it and still dabbling. And I'm definitely excited about the future of use cases for real estate, like tokenization, title companies, raising capital. And I'm sure there's a myriad more that will be coming as well. Uh, amongst other things, I mean, NFTs and stuff. I mean, there's some, some pretty cool stuff coming down the pipe, but like you said, we could go on and on and on and on. And maybe we have to bring you back sometime to talk some more or bring bring Steve on or whatever. Um, but where can people get a hold of you and or find out more about the tokenization? Where should I be sending people? So we I've made four master classes that are completely free. You can go to realestatecertainty.com. And there's a couple links there, or you can just go direct to whaleclubfreestuff.com. So whaleclubfreestuff.com has these four masterclasses. And I break this down for people who uh, are completely new to blockchain and want to understand the incredible opportunities that we have as real estate investors to make use of this technology. You can go there. You can watch these masterclasses. I think it's good information. Um, and yeah, if you want to learn more, go to whaleclubfreestuff.com. That sounds awesome. Well, I appreciate you very much, good sir. And uh, whaleclubfreestuff.com it is. Paul, That's thank right. you very much. And I uh, look forward to hanging out with you again at the next ski, wherever it is. Awesome, man. No, thanks for having me. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to get to know you. And uh, I'm going to have to have you on my podcast here soon, too. Let's do it.